Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks uh, to all of you for, for coming today. Um, it, it, as Chris uh, mentioned, I'm big on celebration. So when he said, we're celebrating, I said, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, I'll come down. You going to have turducken? <laughs> Uh, I'm also truly honored and humbled uh, to be here as well, um, and, and as well as being delighted to join you uh, uh, to, to celebrate an achievement uh, of a major milestone. Um, as I was uh, speaking uh, to uh, Chris about his um, uh, process of, of introducing uh, uh, Connect Carolina, he's uh, impressed upon me the fact that you've now delivered, and in the process of, of refining, uh, a platform that will serve your needs for many years to come. And I understand even this event today, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, is the result of strong and effective collaboration uh, among technical and functional leadership here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and so we've already given ourselves uh, some applause, but uh, um, I think that's quite remarkable. I really do, uh, what you've accomplished so far. You, you've uh, uh, really done something great. Um, the bad news is, we've kind of, we're approaching that awkward moment when we say, so what? Now what? Right? <laughs> and uh, I'm here to sh uh, today to share with you uh, some thoughts about how uh, you might leverage uh, what you've uh, established uh, in such a way as to continue to capitalize on your success. And I'll turn that on. And that works. Can everybody see the slides? I know something over here. I'm not a big fan of reading slides, but I'd be happy to, um, uh, to do this. I'm a big fan of Marshall McLuhan. The, he's a crazy guy from the 60s who was talking about the medium is the message. And he had all these wonderful quotes, the global village and things like that. So I have some, some kind of uh, lesser known uh, quotes uh, from him. Uh, one of which is, is this one here that um, uh, trying to do yes, uh, today's work with yesterday's tools and yesterday's concepts uh, is, is not a, a happy undertaking, right? I mean, I think we could say that that's kind of an understatement. And I understand you've retired systems here that were 20 to 40 years old. And in fact, one of the systems that you retired was put into service in 1968 before we landed on the moon. So those systems certainly did what they needed to do, didn't they? And there's an old joke uh, among the IT crowd, uh, what's another name for legacy system? Software that works, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that begs the question, why, why do we need to change? If we've got solid systems, we've got these things that have been working for us, workhorse applications. Well, I offer you this as a, as a model for change. Um, is anyone familiar with the picture? Okay, I said it was gonna be interactive and we're getting to that part. All right, this is the Choluteca Bridge in Honduras. And it was designed to withstand the strongest of hurricanes. And it survived Hurricane Mitch, a category five ca uh, hurricane that devastated the Caribbean in 1998. Every single one of the other 150 bridges in Honduras was destroyed by Hurricane Mitch. This picture was taken right after that storm had changed the landscape and moved the river right out from underneath the bridge. <laughs> Completely and permanently. The Japanese company that built the bridge was so proud of it that they put this picture on their brochures. <laughs> Show the strength <laughs> of their construction. But Hurricane Mitch changed the course of the river and so the reason for the Choluteca Bridge changed. In a similar way, your legacy systems were designed and built for an entirely different river. And by developing Connect Carolina, you have recognized that the rivers moved. And you've built a new bridge, equipping yourselves with the tools and concepts necessary to meet the challenges of our time. And this sounds all well and good, but let's face it, and you know it, Change is difficult, right? It is, and it's often quite disorienting, and it does a number on our sense of connection. I would like to suggest to you this morning that courageous questions help us to restore connection and significance 
amidst profound change. Our questions and answers serve to connect us to and remind us of what is most important. Courageous questions and profound answers connect us to each other, to our past, and to our future. I have to admit as well that I have a love of great questions, and I want to share a few of them with you to kind of prime the pump. But we'll get warmed up first with a couple of, couple of straightforward ones. With a show of hands, who here has been at uh, UNC Chapel Hill for less than one year? Okay. Great. Um, who's been here for a year or more? Great. All right. Now, now comes the tricky part. Keep those hands up. Keep your hands up if you've been here five years or more. Right? Everybody look around, too. I mean, this is for you. Uh, keep your hands up if you've been here 10 years or more. Okay. And now the big one, 20 years or more? Okay. Anybody here when uh, Lyndon Johnson was president? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all the hands went down, good. All right, <laughs> all right one, more, uh, one more bit of interactivity here. How many folks are from the technical side of the house? Okay. And how many folks are from the functional side? Now, the trick question, how many are from both? Good for you, all right. We have some, all right, excellent. So we have great diversity here, both in terms of tenure, in terms of uh, skill sets, um, and in terms of worldview, right? We leverage that. This is one of the reasons I absolutely love working in higher education and have loved working in higher education. We leverage diversity like nobody's business. And, uh, and, and it's great, um, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so let's think about it for a minute too. Um, how much change have you seen over the course of 20 years? Just think about that. It's one of my favorite, uh, favorite uh, icebreaker questions. All right, now another question, another set of questions. It's getting a little more difficult. That was the, that was the uh, formative uh, evaluation. Now we'll get to the summative. Um, Show of hands, how many of you remember your first day here? <laughs> okay, now you just started, so you got no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Question, and we don't have to answer it. We'll play uh, Quaker rules unless uh, the spirit moves you. You don't need to shout it out, but think about it. Why did you come to work that day? Now, next question. Why did you come to work today? So do, <laughs> so the, the real underlying question that this leads to, is there a difference between what, how you came, why you came to work the first day and why you came to work today? And if so, what's that difference? That's a really important question. It's a courageous question that we ask ourselves and it requires a, a, a level of depth to your response in order to really fish out what, what drives you, what motivates you, right? So uh, my reason, I'll share with you, my, my reason for coming to work has been pretty much the same for the, for the last 20 years, with the exception when I worked with Chris, and then I, you know, he, he didn't make me come to work. So, no. um, I, um, I come to work each day so I can use uh, my talents to improve the lives of the people I serve. That's why I come to work. And that could be as a musician, it could be uh, as a technologist, or it could be as uh, somebody who's here sharing some thoughts with you. Um, and speaking of those uh, we serve, uh, each of us in this room uh, has customers, right? And uh, whether you're a customer of, of IT or you use IT information technologies uh, in the service of your customers, we're all here because uh, we have customers. So let's look at some questions from, from our customers. Um, Customers are simply those people we serve, and I realize that customer is often considered a dirty word here in academia, um, in, in higher education, but we don't need to get hung up on it, um, and, and I'm well aware that uh, I have, uh, for instance, at UVA, I have faculty, I have students, and I have patients as my customers, um, but customer is, is a term that embraces them all. Uh, folks in our library reminded me once when I got up and, and used the, the C word um, that they have patrons. I said, yes, you do. That's good. I'll add that to my list. Um, 
So regardless of what we call them and who they are, our customers have three very important questions for us as service providers. And I would suggest that these three questions from your customers have to be answered first, right from the get-go, before any other questions are addressed. Customers want to know if you can be trusted, if you're competent, and in addition, they want to know if you care. Only after you've established and satisfied those three questions can you proceed to the other questions about how brilliant you are, okay? what you know, and what you're going to propose to do for them, ostensibly for a fee, right? So I would like to, um, at this moment, share with you a little uh, illustration of trust uh, that my father once uh, shared with me as I entered my teenage years. Uh, he uh, sat at the, the kitchen table and held up a piece of paper and, and said, because uh, we didn't have iPads back then, no. <laughs> he said, uh, this is trust. And, and uh, this brand new sheet of paper, um, and it represents all of the um, uh, activities and relationships uh, and uh, uh, contracts that we have had together. This is a violation of that trust. We have two options at this point. We can throw it away, or we can uncrinkle the paper and begin again. And in so doing, trying not to tear the paper and ruin the visual, there we go. And in so doing, I can Move it out, right? I can get it almost back to where it was, but it's still crinkled, but it's still there. And this is, a, this is what trust, this is how precious trust is, this is how easy it is to, to uh, lose it, and this is how difficult it is to get it back. So think about that as, as we go through and look at what our customers are trying to say when they say, we need you to trust us. We need you to care about what we care about. We need you to understand what we value and deliver that to us with the greatest of urgency. So who are your customers and what do they value? This is a question that um, uh, my staff and I uh, ponder. This is a question I brought with me uh, to UVA uh, five years ago when I, when I came there. Um, and uh, understanding this is absolutely critical. It changes, and we need to be, uh, have our finger on the pulse. Um, once you have established the, this point, however, you have the basis of what can be a very productive uh, relationship. And when I say productive relationship, I mean a relationship that's not just based on trust, but is mutually beneficial. Both you and your customer benefit. It's participatory. Both you and your customer show up ready. It's clear and specific. Each one of you understands your expectations and accountabilities. It's consistent, right? It doesn't change day to day, rapidly, vast, vast, uh, um, uh, with vast change in, in between. It's caring and intimate. I understand what's important. It improves continuously, if you're doing it right. And it's fueled by courageous questions and profound answers. And these courageous questions help us to navigate change as we move together into the future. Dun, dun, dun. That's not my father, but I don't think it's Marshall McLuhan either. But yeah. So as I mentioned before, courageous and, and profound questions can be used to connect us to the past and the future. That's because courageous questions allow for creativity. They open us to new possibilities. Courageous questions create clarity, say that one, and ownership while they instill power and strength. Yeah. Back to Marshall again. But we walk into the future backwards. We have to be aware of that because there are deep patterns to history. And these patterns project themselves into the future. For example, when the automobile was first invented, it was referred to as the horseless carriage. Right? They were walking into the future backwards. This is a carriage that doesn't require a horse. It's not an automobile yet because we hadn't turned ourselves 180 degrees and faced the future and understood what it, the implications of the technology really were. When we develop new software systems, we have to question these patterns uh, very clearly. Otherwise, we run the risk of preserving the past in the medium of software, just like an ancient insect in amber, right? We don't, we don't want to reify that. Reminds me of the story of, uh, of the, of the uh, Easter dinner 
uh, we'll switch holidays. And, and the, the young girl is, is in a kitchen and the mother's cutting the, the top two inches off the ham. And the little girl says, why did you do that? And she said, well, because my mom always did that. Why don't you call grandma? So she calls grandma and says, grandma, why don't you cut the t top two inches off of the ham? And she said, well, because my mom always did that. Let's call great grandma. And they called great grandma and they said, why did you cut off the top two inches of the ham? And great grandma says, well, because my pan was two inches too short for the ham. <laughs> So given the success uh, to date that you've had with the Connect uh, Carolina platform, I'm sure, and, and I know you're all well aware that great software comes from great people working together and asking uh, courageous questions of each other. The future's provoked. Oftentimes we think that it happens to us. And sometimes it can uh, appear that way. Um, because uh, the other courageous question that we need to contemplate, if the future is provoked, then that begs this question of will it be provoked by you, by us, or will it be provoked by somebody else? It happens all the time, right? One of the questions that I ask uh, my team is what are we willing to struggle for? Is a litmus test. Are we willing to struggle for this? Is it worth struggling for? So I would uh, offer that to you. What are you willing to struggle for as you move forward to refine and optimize the Connect Carolina platform? Ask this question as well when you're seeking to provoke the future. And remember, if you don't ask it, someone else is, whether they're inside or outside your organization. Think, just think about MOOCs for a minute. Everybody heard about MOOCs? Massively online open courses. I'm going to replace our academic institutions someday. Maybe. <laughs> okay. However, it's also very important that we remain present and engaged and have good cheer throughout the process. Otherwise, you wind up the risk of, of having the software inflicted upon you, right? Rather than having a system that meets your needs and is responsive to change. So let's take a little bit of a look of how we get from here to there. Change itself. And I've observed over the course of my career that our workplace uh, seems to be filled with people who are doing their level best to either avoid deep dilemmas or confront them and grow. That's kind of like the, the um, uh, statement that there are three types of people in the world, uh, those who know math and those who don't. No, I'm still, you're still with me, that's good. <laughs> uh, Peter Senge, um, who is an insightful author of, of The Fifth Discipline, which uh, was a, a late 20th century, I love saying it, late 20th century uh, book, um, uh, expressed this succinctly uh, in, in this point here. But I would like to, um, at the risk of being, you know, invoking uh, any sort of hubris and, and, and uh, some response from the gods above, I, I'd like to just modify it slightly and, and give you Sean's version of it which is people don't resist change, they resist being changed by people they don't trust. Okay. When I was at Stanley Black & Decker, I worked in mergers and acquisitions. And I came in as part of the acquisition team. And I came in and said, hi, we bought you, your world's gonna change, and here's what we're gonna be doing. And let's walk through this together. We'll get out okay on the other side. And I can't tell you the number of conversations I had with folks and universally, the, the folks that survived um, the change, that chose to survive the change, that chose to adapt and move forward, were those that were very upfront with me at the beginning, bless you, um, and said, you know what, we'll change, we'll, we agree, you know, we, we understand we've been uh, acquired, but we refuse to suck. That's what they said. Um, so you have to show us how you're going to make us better. And I said, okay, we're game on, we're good. This is going to work well. The essence of cha leading change is changing yourself. And if so, uh, doing so among people who you trust facilitates that transformation. And so I'd like to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into how we can build trust. 
And this is the language of, of trust which was uh, uh, presented by David Meister, M-A-I-S-T-E-R, David Meister, uh, in his book, The Trusted Advisor, another late 20th century uh, management book. Um, and he um, in, envisioned uh, five um, languages or five um, attributes of a language of trust that uh, he uh, promoted. First is to engage using language of interest and concern. Some of the questions that emerge from that. How does that make you feel? Are you threatened? Does that threaten you? Does that put you in a place that is very uncomfortable? Right? That's engaged. Those are, I have your attention, you have my attention. Let's talk about what really, really matters. As we go, we listen using language of empathy and curiosity. What would that mean to you? Please help me understand what's driving the bus here. Okay. As we progress, we frame using language of perspective and candor. One of the more difficult questions, one of the more um, uh, courageous questions I've ever heard asked is, are we capable of doing this successfully? That's a tough question to answer. It's an easy question to answer if you want to just flip it up. You know, yeah, of course, we could do that. Right? How many times have you heard that? What if somebody said, I don't know? Let's explore that. These are the invitations that you have to go deeper and build something wonderful. And as you do so, you envision with your customer using language of possibility and exploration. I call this with my staff, creating a place for the change to live. And when uh, my wife and I decided, we had lived in Connecticut far too long, and uh, New England far too long uh, before that, and we decided to move. And we didn't know where, but we knew that we wanted to uh, uh, teach our children what it was to move, because neither she nor I had moved uh, uh, before we went to graduate school. And uh, uh, when, when we came, when it, we, uh, came home and, and talked about uh, relocating, we asked our children to work with us to um, identify desirable geographic locations. And in doing so, we created a, a place for that change to live. So we weren't, rather than leaving here, we were talking about going there. And it was entirely um, uh, vital. Um, now my daughter to this day will still say, we aren't in Paris, Daddy. <laughs> you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. And my son will remind me that we're not in Hawaii. Those are their top choices. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Um, once you've decided um, uh, where change is going to live, then the last uh, language of trust, which is commitment. This is the language of joint accountability. Do we agree? I, I don't know if you've heard this, but I know it in Virginia there is something that they don't, one word they do not like to say in Virginia, it's no. I don't know if that's true here, because I'm not, I'm a Yankee. All right. Actually, I'm a damn Yankee. I, did, I moved down here and decided to stay. But that's what they say, right? Um, do we agree that if we do this, we will need to delay that, or we can't do that, or we, there's an opportunity cost to this? Have you had those conversations, those difficult questions, right? Commitment, accountability drives us towards what we've envisioned, which is the result of what we've framed, which is the result of listening with empathy after we've engaged successfully. Right? In addition, once we get all that done, we have to be explicit regarding how we intend to change. And basically, there are three options. Okay. One big bite. Right. We, we've got to do it, it's a big bang, we're going live. Right. We've seen those. Um, several large bites. In lean, this is called model cell. We'll do it here, and then if it works, we'll transplant it there and then we'll transplant it there and we'll scale it out, right? And then lots of little bites. Again, in Lean, it's called Kaizen, right? With little improvements every day and by a preponderance of these little improvements, we will transmogrify into something wonderful. Unfortunately, Kaizen doesn't necessarily work in our culture because every 90 days we have to get on the phone and talk to the street, okay? Um, takes a little bit longer sometimes for Kaizen to reach an, an enterprise level um, uh, effect. However, each choice is based upon just the level of risk and the level of urgency that we find ourselves uh, in at the moment. So if we find ourselves confronted with a highly urgent and risky situation, then we need a big bang uh, response. We should all be clear about that approach. 
Alternatively, we can move incrementally, varying the amount of change that we choose to take on at any amount of time. That's a variable that we should be very explicit about as we move forward. Once we've chosen how, we next need to resolve um, three areas of potential disagreement. I call them my three challenges. Before we begin any work, do we have any, are we agreed with regard to the current state? Do we all agree on this? Can we memorialize that in such a way that we won't ever have to revisit it except to help us move forward? There's disagreement over the future state. Do we know what it is we're trying to achieve? Are we clear on that? And if we're not, let's get clear on that and then move forward. And the final disagreement, source of disagreement, are we clear about how we plan to get there, right? So we've got the big bite, little bite, medium bites, right? So we know how in general. Do, is everybody bought into the plan by which we're going to go from point A to point B? Right? Those three uh, disagree uh, challenges or, or potential disagreements need to be nailed down before, before you begin. Otherwise, uh, the journey will not be, not be pleasant. It's been my experience. So over the course of my career, I've identified lessons uh, that inform and are informed by this approach toward change. Um, and I'd like to see how many uh, resonate with you. And uh, so I'll ask you to please uh, raise your hand. And these slides I probably will read just, uh, just to make sure we, we've got it. Okay, a little experiment. Change is more about execution than strategy. Anybody that resonate with folks? So I've found that change is the aggregated result of a series of challenges that are confronted by individuals, hopefully, as I said before, within an atmosphere of trust. Those individual challenges that are successfully confronted, bless you, um, are uh, uh, taken together, result in enterprise-wide change. How about this one? Make your choice, big bite, little bite, Use the language of trust, right? Engage, listen, frame, envision, and commit to address the three challenges, current state, future state, and the, and the uh, plan to get from point A to point B, and then begin the work. Resonate with folks? All right, we've got some good folks there. Everybody coffee kicked in yet? No? No. How about this one? Start simple. Focus on building trust over optimizing execution, and complexity will come on its own. Yes? Are we getting better? Yeah, okay, we're trying. Okay, good. How many times have you been involved in projects that try to boil the ocean? I gotta do this, that, it's gotta be perfect. Okay. How about uh, projects that are so focused? I love this. This is, this is a good way to drive Sean nuts, if you ever want to. Um, so focused on meeting an arbitrary deadline that they forget that they're supposed to deliver value. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we have in, in several, several doomed projects. So when, when I ran the, the PMO at Stanley, I, I had to rescue projects too, and, and there were some doomed projects out there that, that um, you know, that, to, to a person, uh, the, the leadership had, had really chosen the arbitrary deadline over the value. And uh, they would go through a very similar uh, uh, process that I, I would uh, call, I called first the flight from quality. Oh, we're running late. Ship the software, ship the software. We'll fix it. We'll fix it after we go live. Okay, and then that didn't that that got you only so far, right? And then the next step was the flight from scope. Right? Oh, we can't do that. We're going to phase two of that. We're going to phase two of that. We're going to wait right on that, right? Okay. That so think about always be thinking about with your team. What's simple? A lot of the agile methodologies that are out there nowadays, I think, have grown, uh, uh, gained a foothold and, and grown because of this. They deliver value incrementally over over time, and. Um, all right, how about this one? Integrate your technical and functional talent early and use the language of trust to establish and build intimacy among team members and with your customers. How about that one? Folks are, okay, good. It is absolutely vital. I, I remember when I, the first project that I teed up at, at UVA, I had um, IT folks at the table with the functional folks, the technical and functional folks at the table for the kickoff meeting. And, um, the functional folks were, were like, Who, what are you doing here? And the technical folks said, what are we doing here? And I said, this is our project. We're, we have to deliver it together. And I'm not going to uh, have a bunch of conversations with folks 
um, who then deliver um, uh, orders uh, or, or system configurations, right? We don't play that game, right? You have to come up with a precise specification in order for us to move the system and change this, that, and the other. Um, we need to build it. It's brand new. We didn't have, uh, have an existing system that we needed to be concerned about. So it's a, a greenfield software development project. Um, and at the end, when we did our lessons learned at the end of the project, uh, all of the folks said, hey, that was really good. Let's keep doing that. Let's keep the integration of the technical and functional talent from the inception of the project. It really worked out well. Nobody felt blindsided by either, uh, either technical requirements that were um, in show it or uh, uh, functional requirements. Okay. okay. How about this one? Clarity. Clarity is the currency of change. Seek it constantly in collaboration with your customers and stakeholders and focus on value. So when I was a boy and uh, went out to dinner with my parents, uh, uh, waiters and waitresses would ask my father uh, what he would like to drink with his dinner. And uh, his response 99% uh, of the time was coffee, please, early and often. And um, I think the same thing about clarity. Um, we need to seek clarity early and often regarding the current state, our desired outcome, our plan, and risks and contingencies that emerge along the way. Right? Does that resonate with anybody here? All right. Good. Good, good. All right. I want to be respectful of time and, and all, all that good stuff. So I'm going to, uh, before I get into my horseless carriage and return back to Virginia, which uh, that, that doesn't have a rear view mirror either, by the way, for those of you that have been playing at home, uh, playing along at home. Um, I, I just like to summarize um, uh, some these thoughts and, and, and kind of galvanize them with, with the hope that you could take this out of this room today and have it inform your interactions over the course of the, of the remainder of the, of the day here uh, at the users conference. This is one of my favorite uh, Marshall McLuhan um, quotes. Our, our technology forces us to live mythically. We have to, we have to be better as a result of this. Otherwise, again, if we're, uh, if we're grim and dumb, we'll be mastered by it, right? So we, that, it, it impels us, it compels us to be better. And Connect Carolina is now up and running. Um, and it's my greatest hope and expectation that you'll be able to keep up the momentum this is, this is really important, and to do so, I would ask you to begin today to use the language of trust to engage with your customers, your customers' customers, your colleagues, your partners, asking courageous questions and looking for profound answers while you listen to understand what your customers value. Then work together collaboratively to frame and envision a place for change to live. Commit together to provoke the future in a manner that is responsive to the level of risk and urgency that you face. Come to an agreement over the current state, the future state, and the means by which you intend to move from one to the other. Then begin simply. And along the way, seek clarity constantly as you remain focused on your customers and what they value. Stay engaged and lighthearted throughout so that you remain the master of the technology and not its victim. We all know that change is difficult because change is personal. Concentrate on building and maintaining trust because you must have courage to transform yourself. And this transformation is what I call leadership. Those who transform first lead. And with that, I have one final question that I'd like to share with you before we get on with our day. What would it be like if you chose to be extraordinary in every thought, word, and action? I hope you enjoyed today's conference, and I thank you all very, very much.